Cheers. Cheers. Welcome to Culture Night. Where each week we drink fancy wine and watch movies that are in some way culturally significant. I'm Andrew. And I'm Sarah. And we are here for episode 13. And again, we want to start by thanking everybody for listening, watching, tuning in each week. And um, to all our new subscribers, we really appreciate you. And so we're just going to jump right in with the wine this week. And you want to tell us what we're drinking? We are drinking the 2014 Silver Reserve Petite Syrah from Tobin James. We are big Petite Syrah people. So this one has been sitting in our cellar for a little bit since going on nine years old, I guess. So about time we drink it. Let's check it out. I get a lot of dark fruit, like mm-hmm. like plum. Prune. Mm, prune. Mm-hmm. That's what I thought when I smelled the cork when I yeah. opened it. Oh, wow. It's got a lot of sweetness to it. Wow. That's very complex. Yeah. Um, almost like a ri- really ripe strawberry. Mm-hmm. Give me another sip. Oh, that's delicious. Yeah, this is this is a good one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess it's strawberry, almost like strawberry fruit leather. I was I was gonna say fruit roll up, but I mm-hmm. feel like that's not doing it justice. That like re- like really concentrated, mm-hmm. fresh strawberry taste. Yeah. Yeah. Delicious. Can't wait to to dive into that some more. Yeah. All right, and. With the wine, I hate to say out of the way because mm-hmm. now it's it's in the way we can drink it now, but it is time for Behind the Screens. All right, I'm just going <laughs> to kick back and relax with this wine while you educate me on some yes. movie and, Behind the Screens. Yes, so in this segment we go behind the big screens of Hollywood each week and look into some aspect of film, storytelling, production, all that fun stuff. So this week we are talking about the um, the role on the set of Gaffer. Last week we talked about the best boy. And upon learning the definition of best boy, we realized there was a lot more that we needed mm-hmm. to learn. <laughs> so It's um, like one of those words you look in the dictionary and then you realize that all the words that define it, you don't know either. <laughs> yeah. So we had to do a little bit of work to learn what best boy was. And so we decided to start with gaffer this week. The gaffer is the head electrician on the set and is responsible for the execution and sometimes the design of the lighting plan for a production. And the gaffer's assistant is the best boy electric. Uh. So BBE reports to the gaffer. Mm -hmm. The gaffer is under the direction of the director of photography and film or the lighting director on TV. So they are the ones that come up with the plan for the lighting and how they want Mm -hmm. it to look. And, Uh, Sometimes the gaffer is involved with that design, but uh, usually they just execute it. And then the Wikipedia page had um, a little etymology section for where Mm -hmm. the word gaffer came from that I thought was kind of interesting. So the term gaffer, there was two different um, origins that could be the where it came from. That it either comes from the moving of overhead equipment to control the lighting levels using a long pole with a wide grappling hook on the end called a gaff. So the gaffer uses the Mm -hmm. gaff to control the lighting and that That kind of um, dates back to like Shakespeare times too. Mm -hmm. And then um, the other option is that it could also come from the contraction of the word godfather, um, which country people used to apply to elderly people or those that command respect or elderly men Mm -hmm. that would command respect. And the the female version is gammer for godmother. It's a contraction of those Mm -hmm. things. Um, But then the, the word gaffer was started to be applied specifically to the chief of electrician on a film set in the 1920s. So that's kind of when that gotcha. um, specifically went to the, um, the film association. And the other fun thing that I learned is that the name gaffer gives its name by association to gaffer tape. That's what I was going to say. I've, I've heard that more and more on like the YouTube videos we've watched mm-hmm. about like lighting and mm-hmm. things like that. And uh, gaffer tape is a strong cloth based adhesive tape used within the film and television. Mm-hmm. So, um, I mainly heard it referred to as like gaff tape. And I think that it was only recently that I heard someone say gaffer's tape. And I, I was like, oh, gaffer, right. Mm-hmm. Heard that recently. That makes it a bit more sense there. Yep. So the gaffer is in charge of all the electrician lighting, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Best boy electric reports to him. Yeah. I believe that I, I believe the history more about like it being like a gaff being a tool. And he was the gaffer mm-hmm. was the person that used that tool more than I believe the yeah. godfather and someone that had their really like thick accent that <laughs> eventually yeah. led to gaffer. I felt like that seemed like a stretch too. But anyways, that is our behind the screens for this week. 
And now we're going to jump into our slept on it. So last week we watched Aaron Brockovich. Um, I gave it a 4.2 and you gave it a 6.1. Does your rating change after sleeping on it? A little bit. I might have been a little overexcited with six. I mean, the movie was good. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Going back to your rewatchability, quotability stuff, like it's not, I'm not going to do that a lot. Mm -hmm. I do think it was really popular and a big cultural phenomenon at the time that Mm -hmm. I'd I feel like it had a cultural impact, but I think that my rating should probably go back to like a 5.7, 5.6. Yeah. I think if anything, I'd take mine down from a 4.2 to like a four flat. I just, I don't really have any desire to ever like watch it again, really. Um, And maybe it, if we see more movies that were kind of inspired by that kind of like storytelling aspect Mm -hmm. of it, um, then maybe I'd be a little more interested, but I, I kind of, I don't know if you did any research on your deep dive of like Aaron Brockovich and how closely this was like, to the um, true, true to real life um, might change my opinion at all, but probably not. I'm probably going to move, move it down to a four flat. Well, speaking of that deep dives. All right, let's go. I, I didn't, we're going to call this surface level dive. Cause I really didn't mm-hmm. go too far um, into all of her backstory and stuff. But my first note is that according to Brockovich herself, the movie was true and probably 98% accurate. Although she has not ever been specific about what constitute the 2% inaccuracy. Mm-hmm. So it's, it seems to follow the story pretty closely. Um, mm-hmm. Again, Jimmy, she didn't say what wasn't right about it, but yeah. according to her, it feels very accurate. Yeah. I'd like to I wonder if people that are actually more familiar with the whole case would agree mm-hmm. as much about like um, how the town kind of perceived it and um, how the actual trial unfolded mm-hmm. uh, because she might be a little bit of a biased of a very true there. seeing as it's, a self-titled yeah movie. and if she was set to make a whole lot of money off of it she probably wouldn't be like no nah, the movie was crap it wasn't true at all like mm-hmm. she <laughs> she wants people to see it so um i would take her review with a grain of salt mm-hmm. but um it's good According- to know that she doesn't completely off the bat say no this was not real especially because i feel like it was a pretty aggressive portrayal of a person that mm-hmm. you know to for her to say oh it's pretty true means that sh- she was portrayed fairly accurately mm-hmm. with her push-up bra and all mm-hmm. that stuff. So um, I should have gone a little bit more into the town and like the news from the time, but I ran out of time. So yeah, I don't blame you. I wasn't too excited about digging into this one. Like <laughs> I said, I, you know, gave it a pretty low score mm-hmm. and uh, yeah. Um, my next note is that, so her motorcycle boyfriend, George was portraying um, Jorge Hallaby, her, her real life neighbor. That's mm-hmm. what his real name was. And when the film came out, Brockovich and Masri were threatened with a smear, I guess, lawsuit. And unless they paid 310000 the media would be told falsely that Brockovich and Masri had an affair and that she was a bad mother. And because of this, um, Jorge and her ex-husband, Sean Brown, were arrested because of this whole scandal. I don't, uh, I don't, I don't get it. So she... So I think they were upset with how they were portrayed in the movie. Mm -hmm. And so they were going to go to the media and say that her and Masri were having an affair and that's how she got the job and like was so involved in this. And unless they paid the money Mm -hmm. because they were going to be falsely accused weird of all the stuff yeah, so there was apparently some drama so maybe it was not as accurate yeah. as she's making Seems it like out a to bold be strategy to kind of like threaten a bunch of lawyers with mm-hmm. um lies <laughs> yeah. the charges were dropped against mm-hmm. them but there was some drama when the movie came out um, like i don't understand people that are like hmm, these people just took down a giant mega corporation by doing so much legwork and so much painstaking work to actually get this you know done and they didn't quit at all i'm gonna go ahead and have to file a frivolous lawsuit based on lies and i think i'll win yeah. Who knows? <laughs> I'm sure there was probably a lot more behind the scenes there mm-hmm. than that one sentence that I yeah. just read. Yeah. Um, and then also fun fact, Aaron Brockovich, the real person was actually in the movie. She has a cameo in the beginning when um, Julia Roberts takes the kids out to the restaurant because she found the cockroaches in the sink. Mm-hmm. And Aaron Brockovich is the waitress at the restaurant when they're ordering. Ah, so interesting. fun fact, she actually appears in the movie and, um, she just where she is now and what she's doing. She is the real Aaron Brockovich is president of Brockovich research and consulting. And she also is a consultant for the New York law firm whites in Luxembourg. So she's still working in litigation. Mm-hmm. Um, most of her work has to do with contaminated water, environmental 
type issues, um, some like oil spills, train derailments. She was at the East Palestine, Ohio Mm -hmm. train derailment just a couple months ago, weeks ago, months ago, ago, probably at this point. Um, And doing protesting for that. It seems like not all of her cases are as successful as this from Mm -hmm. her Wikipedia description, but that she is still trying to advocate for America putting in better infrastructure and making sure we're taking care with how our water is treated and all that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So she's trying to advocate for the health of I guess kind of one of the benefits of like having nothing and then suddenly getting millions and probably a lot more money from the movie itself is that you can just kind of afford to do whatever cases and work you want to do the rest of your life. Not that she was, I wonder, did she actually like go to law school at any point or is she? That's what I was um, hoping to find out is I assumed like, oh, after all this, she must've gone to law mm-hmm. school, but it does not appear that she did. She has an associate's degree mm-hmm. and um, she has like some honorary doctorates and masters from speaking at universities, but it does not appear that she ever actually went back to school Interesting. for any further um, education, any further education there. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention, unrelated to actual real life Aaron Brockovich, is that this movie was nominated for a bunch of awards, a bunch of mm-hmm. um, Academy Awards, Golden Globes, Screen Actors Guild Awards, BAFTA Awards, MTV Movie Awards, mm-hmm. um, and that Julia Roberts actually won the Best Actress Honor for the Academy Awards, the SAG Awards, BAFTA Awards, Critics' Choice Awards, and the Golden Globes for her role in this. So um, I guess that's we why should. it was such a hype do a awards show at the end of like the year or season or something of this. You just have all these excellent ideas. That would be really fun. The bracket for March Madness, Mm -hmm. the awards. I love it. Yeah. Oh man, we got to start. That's like four or five categories. I don't want to go like too big in Mm -hmm. boldness, but um, I think it'd be fun to do. Something we probably need to start planning now is picking some categories so that we can start Mm -hmm. thinking about it. And it's not just at the end of the year. Best story, best like. Mm -hmm. Can we get dressed up? Sure. Ooh. I'm in my tuxedo already. <laughs> Very true. All right. So that's kind of the only research I did. I probably could have gone a lot deeper on that. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Just like you said, wasn't too exciting. And I mean, it seems fairly accurate that it's not like there was some big scandal mm-hmm. about. Yeah, we were also kind of on a short week this week. So Yeah. So on that note, short week, let's mm-hmm. bounce into tonight. What are we watching tonight? We are watching Scarface from 1983. So heading back into the 80s. Mm-hmm. And it is rated R. Mm-hmm. So now let's hop into the time machine and head back to 1983. So 1983, the top three movies released that year were Star Wars Episode Six: Return of the Jedi, uh, grossing $249 million. Second was Tootsie, uh, grossing $136 million, and Flashdance, grossing $90 million. The top three songs were Every Breath You Take by The Police, Billie Jean by Michael Jackson and Flashdance What a Feeling by Irene Cara. Well, I'm familiar with all three of those songs, and mm-hmm. I don't think I knew Flashdance was a movie, but. Um, oh my gosh, you've not seen Flashdance? I have not. Add that to something that I've seen that you have not. All right, we can put that on the list to, to watch someday. It's very good. So that kind of sets the, the vibe of like what movies kind of were out at that time and what, what everyone was kind of listening to. Mm-hmm. So let's uh, go to the questions. Have you seen it before? I have not seen Scarface before. Um, have I, you seen it? I have seen it once about like 10 years or so ago. Um, I remember bits and pieces of it and like a couple like small scenes, but not really the overall like plot line or. Um, well, I'm sure it's hard to remember because it's two hours and 50 minutes long. Yeah, it's quite, quite the <laughs> epic. So uh, we're going to have to buckle in for this one. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you know about the movie? Um, not a whole lot. Um, I know it's like crime drama mm-hmm. um drugs guns i don't know anything specific mm-hmm. other than that that's about the overarching story that i can give you yeah i assume someone steals some drugs there's gun fighting or like selling drugs fighting with guns mm-hmm. yeah that's about all i got and they'll turn that into a three-hour movie mm-hmm. <laughs> as only hollywood can um so yeah, I think I it's time to, time to hop into it and see if you're right. Yeah. All right. You want me to say it now? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Scarface. Okay. I don't cheers. think we usually cheers for the second part. I feel yeah. like we, you always are like, oh, it'll help line up audio. But I think we usually do it at the end. 
We can cheers as much yeah. as we want to cheers. That's true. Can always edit it in post. <laughs> okay. Scarface. Yeah. Um, that was uh, Ooh, that was a lot. That was long, <laughs> and I mean, I know I say like every movie's long. This one was two hours and fifteen. This minutes. one takes the cake for yeah. being the longest so yeah. far. Just yeah, we'll get into it in a little bit, but I feel like it was unnecessarily long. Yeah. But right. um, let's start with the the wine. You know, the most important part of this, God. first and foremost. So the wine scale going zero being, you know, a good wine still, and 10 being absolutely amazing. A low score does not necessarily mean a bad wine. We're not, all the wines we drink are good. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, this wine, the Petite Syrah. From 2014, Silver mm -hmm. Reserve, Tobin James. I'm feeling it 8.6. I had 7.9. 7.9. And like, it was great. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It was just so much more than I was expecting. Like the, I mean, it definitely was roll it back to us mm -hmm. taking the first sip. Mm -hmm. It was so good. Yeah. It wasn't too sweet. Wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't super, uh, like alcohol forward or, or tart or anything. Very drinkable, very pleasant, not overly complex. Just, uh, a good I was getting strawberry, it you was know. very strawberry last night. Mm -hmm. Full disclosure, we did this in two nights. <laughs> um, but tonight I was getting like almost like a sour grape lollipop taste. Not in the sweet way, but just in that like that mm -hmm. first taste of something sour. I don't know. But like in the best way. It was so good. Mm -hmm. I, when I drank my last sip, I was really sad. <laughs> yeah. I highly recommend that one. <laughs> yeah. 7.9. And I, I think, think we've had good luck with with petite Syrahs. Oh, we always have good luck with petite Syrahs. But thinking back, like our 2018 trip to Tobin James, where we had a 2014 petite Syrah, that one mm -hmm. was like a 9.2. And like, I was trying to think of like what it was really like a standout wine in my mind. Yeah. And like, that's one of them. And this one was really good. And this wine's it defense not, is nine years old and we do not very, we don't not keep our, um, our wines in a like high, we're tech, working high to be better wine cellar, but, uh, I did not think it really showed any signs of going bad, mm -hmm. and I thought it was a very good one. I was really bracing myself from some like sediment in the bottom or something, just because it was mm -hmm. older. But it was amazing, so yeah. good. So if you are ever in the recommend. store and see a Petite Syrah, not necessarily the Tobin James, even though we do love this one, highly recommend the Petite Syrahs. Very yeah. good, very good varietal. We're big Petite Syrah people. Um, next up being the movie rating out of ten. You want well, me to go first? Yeah. 5.6. Yeah, I was going to go about a 4.8. Oh, man. Yeah. I was expecting you to rate it higher than me. Yeah, I just, uh, I didn't really find it super intriguing or followable or overall enjoyable to watch. I can understand why it was like really intriguing to mm -hmm. people at the time. I try to like take myself back and about what this would have been like to see at the time and mm -hmm. i and i can see that and i see why it was like a a big cultural thing yeah it, I'm just, rating, it was a very slow it was slow i'm definitely rating these more in the lens of how much i enjoy them now not necessarily how much would i have enjoyed them if i was watching it the year they came out mm -hmm. and i understand like if there weren't many movies of this type or this was you know a or if there, this was a, a big era of those movies and this was kind of, you know, what people wanted to see at the time, um, I could see it being more enjoyable, but the the storytelling didn't seem that great. Oh, it seemed like not. it was moving very slowly. And okay, maybe you're convincing me <laughs> to yeah. drop it back to like a 4.8. I was actually going to rate it even lower, but then I, I thought of the quotability portion of it and I do remember the like, say hello to my little friend, like line, um, hearing that a lot. I don't even think I knew that was from this movie, but I definitely know mm -hmm. that that's something... But that's really the only main quote from this movie. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, it's, it, it's. It, well, it, we can get into all yeah. the, all the details of it, but it not, not our favorite. Yeah. Um, I guess we'll, we'll go into the movie description next. Mm -hmm. So a lot to recap in this. <laughs> um, I feel like it follows a fairly typical archetype of someone starting from nothing, gaining a lot of power, fame, money and whatnot it going to their head it they're the hubris leading to their downfall and them eventually losing it all and or in this case dying so tony montana um arrives as an immigrant from uh cuba 
from the Fidel Castro regime uh, is able to get a green card by killing someone eventually meets or makes his way into the drug crime scene in uh, Miami, Florida uh, eventually moves up the ranks there and through his own connections starts uh, cutting out his original bosses and makes a whole lot of money. Um, it gets a little bit too cocky, a little bit too caught up in himself and too caught up too much in the power play. And it eventually leads to his downfall and it, losing his friends, his wife and his life and his sister and his sister who also kind of had the weird uh, tension there going on the whole movie i'm glad she brought it up at the end yeah all right on to our tv description this says after getting a green card in exchange for assassinating a cuban government official tony montana stakes a claim on the drug trade in miami viciously murdering anyone who stands in his way tony eventually becomes the biggest drug lord in the state controlling nearly all the cocaine that comes through miami but increased pressure from the police wars with colombian drug cartels and his own drug-fueled paranoia served to fuel the flame of his eventual downfall a little bit more more flowery words but Mm -hmm. we can have that the same just there. Can I also give myself a pat on the back for reading this one relatively well for the first <laughs> time in a couple weeks? Composure, composure, breaking character. Hey, Aaron Brockovich was uncalled <laughs> for. I just want to know who wrote that one. They must have been real proud of, real proud of themselves. Oh, I hope one. they were extra smug. Mm-hmm. Uh, how well did it age? Uh, what was, oh, the, no, sorry. was what, the movie what you expected? What you expected? Um, having seen it, for the most part, yes. I don't remember it being quite as slow and long. But overall... Um, it was what I remembered. Um, I will say that it wasn't really what I was expected. Um, uh, jumping a little bit to my first note was I was not expecting the like politics, foreign affairs stuff of like C- Castro and Cuban mm-hmm. immigrants and all that kind Setting of stuff. Setting the stage in the beginning. Yeah, I was I was not really ready for that. Um, and maybe like I have not seen The Godfather either, and so I don't know if I was kind of confusing these and it was i don't know that like florida and the whole like um latin hispanic culture was not really what i was expecting as much um i mean i knew the drugs and that the drugs and the guns and the violence and the crime over all of that was Mm -hmm. pretty typical i was expecting a lot of blood but yeah what i found interesting going back to the whole setting the stage thing is that the timeline was essentially the early 80s like it said like 1980 i think in some of the original clips in this movie came out in 1983 so this wasn't trying to show like a you know previous era or anything and i feel like the the whole rise and fall of of tony montana happening between 1980 and the time the movie came out three years it seems like a pretty like um tight timeline there quick turnaround it seems like this would have taken place over the course of several years going going from like literally just emigrating to america and um getting a green card and all that should have taken a lot more time so um just found that kind of little tidbit Mm -hmm. interesting there uh how well did it age slash could it be made today um yes and yes i feel like it it aged fairly well for for what it Mm -hmm. is i mean obviously there's like the times like the fashion and technology is outdated but that's always going to be the case but like yeah, the, I think the, the general have, story probably. I think they would have had some more legitimate Cuban actors playing it. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure Al Pacino is Italian. Yeah. Uh, I think that's really what threw me off the most. <laughs> and yeah, it was, he did a great job acting. His accent just was kind of bothering me the whole time. And I know it's become like an iconic Al Pacino accent there, but uh, I I think if they were to remake this, they would have cast it as someone. No, no Castro, no pun intended. Um, cast it as someone actually Cuban to make it a bit more believable there, and all of the like supporting cast there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but otherwise, I think the storyline didn't seem like it was too, um, you know, crazy to not be able to be made today. Mm-hmm, for sure. Um, did they say the title of the movie? I don't think they did. I don't think they did. No, he did have a scar on his face, but I don't think they ever referenced it really. And they asked mm-hmm. him how he got the scar. But that was really it at the very beginning, and they never really touch on it after that. Yeah, I was expecting it, I mean, not to be blatant, mm-hmm. like, Scarface. I was expecting more of, like, a even, like, maybe, like, his people or, like, Manny being, like, hey, Scarface, like, some mm-hmm. kind of joking reference to it, but... Yeah, I feel like a better name would have been something, like, referencing, like, the, the, the drugs or something, like, you know, Miami crime or something, mm-hmm. a bit more um, 
directed than that. Scarface just kind of seems kind of weird, especially as they didn't really seem to reference it later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not a fan. Um, so yeah, I would say they, the title did not fit the movie. The answer to that next question. Yeah, I think I think they could have done better. I mean, not that it's a bad title for a movie. Mm -hmm. I think if they wanted that to be the title, they should have incorporated that more into the story. I think. Mm -hmm. To make or, it or had better. him like get a scar and that's part mm -hmm. of his like that's what i was there. gonna say too like some kind of this is where it came from and that's why he's called this instead of just a one quick reference in the first five minutes of a three-hour movie mm -hmm. um were there any actors that went on to do bigger things obviously al pacino became quite quite an actor and it's kind of well known yeah michelle pfeiffer um f murray abraham who i uh I, I think I saw that he, yeah, he was using the opening credits. I saw the name there and it reminded me because he was just recently in season two of The White Lotus, which we've just watched. And it's wild because he played a very, very different character, oh, yeah. but you oh. could still tell it was him watching it, but it just felt very Just, just from certain angles though. I was not always certain it was him and then, mm -hmm. then I would kind of see it, but it was, he's definitely different now. Yeah. Because so he plays like a kind of almost like a goofy, not grandpa. Yeah. Like horny grandfather in the white lotus and in this he was more <laughs> exactly. of like a, a mobster but mm -hmm. very uh very interesting and yeah i don't think there were really any other ones no that, one that stuck out to me just mentioned uh what impact do you think this movie had on pop culture i mean i have not seen a lot of movies and a lot of mm -hmm. things that i think would quote or reference this i mean i do know the quote say hello to my little friend mm -hmm. which i think has been quoted a lot um i don't know i don't know that i'm the best person to answer this yeah i'd like to watch the like the godfather and the godfather part two mm -hmm. before I, I could really answer this question well uh because i, I want to know like where they fit in the timeline of this and i just imagine that that this was kind of one of the, the same genre that mm -hmm. was popular around the same time that i don't think it in itself was as much would have done as much Besides, if it weren't for the other movies around the same time of that same genre kind of really mm -hmm. defining crime drama defining what it means to be like you know a, a crime boss mm -hmm. and that rise and fall i agree so on its own i don't think it really was itself super culturally significant but i think as part of that overall era mm -hmm. it was definitely one that you can't mention those movies without mentioning it yeah, I always think of them uh, like together. I'd also be interested to kind and, of uh, and Goodfellas too. I think yes. at the same time um, to kind of talk to I don't know our parents or other people who were around mm -hmm. when this came out and w what was the like in the moment reaction to a movie like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm excited to kind of uh, dig a little bit more into the the background of this movie mm -hmm. and the making, production, and all that. Mm -hmm. So that leads to the final question of: Do you feel cultured after watching it? I do. I mean, I'd always heard, I mean, mm -hmm. the, the title is, I mean, although it doesn't really fit the movie very yeah. well, it's pretty notorious in itself and it, it feels like something that I needed to see. And, um, it's definitely not my favorite kind of movie, mm -hmm. especially just, there was just, it's something that should have been like a show. Yeah. Or like a mini series or something. Yeah. Mini series yeah. That, that just, um, I think this was a, this was a fairly like iconic Al Pacino role. And mm -hmm. I think that that. Honestly, I feel like it's him that makes it more famous than anything else. Right. If you remove him from, from the situation, I don't think this movie is as big as it was. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it, it's hard to say that you were like, you've been, you know, cultured or you, you've seen a lot of the pop culture movies of this era um, without having seen a lot of the Al Pacino mm -hmm. movies and, and knowing um, his actual like roots in his acting there. So, um, yeah, I would say having having watched this makes me feel a bit more cultured than, for sure. th than having not seen it. And like you said, I'm, this makes me excited for future movies mm -hmm. like i feel like we there's been several times where we've watched a movie and been like i feel like this will come back to a couple of times and i think this is another one that will come back to in this genre a lot yeah i'm excited to see like the godfather and, and all that and then obviously some of the more classic noir films eventually <laughs> you're so excited for those <laughs> i got a long list but i'm excited to, to have to add those to our collection mm -hmm. um so on to notes i think we've, it's your turn to go, go first. first all right so um my first note was that it felt like Al Pacino was really overacting with the accent. And I think it's just because I know that he's not mm -hmm. Cuban that I don't know if I would have, it would have annoyed me as much um, if I didn't know that. Yeah. Like I said, it, it might really have been a great accent, off. but I, I don't, I just couldn't take it seriously. No, having seen Al Pacino in other things. Yeah. Like I said, like it threw me off. I was expecting Italian 
mm-hmm. mob boss kind of situation just because that's what I know of Al Pacino that the Cuban accent mm-hmm. and the yeah I'd like to to see how accurate that Cuban accent is I don't know I don't think I know any any Cubans yeah, or I'm know exactly what a Cuban the dialects of accent sounds Spanish. like um but I'd like to hear like critiques on like how good or bad that was if it was absolutely terrible or if it was fairly good um I thought otherwise his acting was good his like facial acting and kind of like especially I thought his drunk acting was 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 mm-hmm. really good too of kind of showing that slumped over slurred you know mm-hmm. moving, whatever and the way he talked when he was in the club with his cigar mm-hmm. i felt like that was that was much better than some drunk acting that i've seen before um my next note was why did they need so much fanfare to kill that guy when they were still in that freedom city camp whatever mm-hmm. it seemed like it would have been a lot easier especially while there's already a diversion going on to just stab the guy and not have him go through this weird like tent where everyone's chanting and you know rushing at him it would have been, seemed easier to just kind of like knife him at any point and i know we made it he made a statement of like you know i'm gonna do this guy up good all i did was stab him once i was expecting a bigger hype there yeah like slash him up or something you stabbed him once you didn't need all the all the build up there mm-hmm. seemed kind of unnecessary I agree uh, we mentioned F. Murray Abraham being being in the movie as much, much younger and different than he was in The White Lotus. Um, next note was the clear elevator that they had in that first uh, drug lord's house. I have a note about this too. That I just can't imagine having that in my home. It would feel very awkward and or just like, I don't know, inconvenient to be. I'm going to go down like these to the first floor here in this clear elevator while everyone's just watching me just... I mean, like eight-year-old me would think that was dope. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's like not super practical, but also I think it also just fits so like architecturally with the times of what that house looked like. I mean, the whole wall uh, Mm -hmm. opposite it was glass. All the chairs were made of clear plastic. I assume it was plastic. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was glass. I don't know. But just like everything was kind of It just seemed like these houses were clearly built to flex and not to be lived in. I mean, 100%. It was more, these are my party palaces where I'm going to have these big, you know, crazy crazy events or something and I'm going to flex to everyone, but not, I'm not going to like raise my kids here, have any sort of like home life, be here for any reason other than. Flex. Yeah, I feel like we mentioned while we were watching it that like I can't imagine just coming home and being like, oh, I feel comfortable here. Let me take my shoes off and sit down on the couch and like relax. That's mm-hmm. not, it's not a place you go to relax. I mean, I think we talked about it in the jerk of these having these these big mansions where nowadays I feel like a lot of more rooms are more practical of like, oh, here's my huge like th- home theater room that I have or here's my, you know, uh, activity room with my like, pool and bar, man cave, whatever. It seemed like a lot of the... Um, rooms here just where i'm gonna have a lot of open space and marble and it's just gonna be empty because i want to have more square footage but not necessarily have anything practical in it Mm -hmm. but also i mean from what it sounds like the amount of money he was raking in it was kind of like yeah put marble on these walls yeah Mm -hmm. clear glass elevator i mean just yeah they should have hired a designer if those if those uh home designers really um existed around them before hgtv um (laughs) My next note was in the club, dancing with a cigar seems miserable. And I, and I, like, I like a good cigar um, in certain situations. I just can't imagine being like in a club, a bunch of a whole lot of, lot of people trying to dance while still keeping a cigar in my mouth, having it like not really fall out or get too like spitty, not like choking on the smoke from it just seems really unnecessary. I mean, having not ever smoked a cigar, I can't really speak to that, but I can imagine it feels impractical. Yeah. I don't know. It just... I just can't imagine that being, I, I put it down, get a new cigar. He can clearly afford yeah. more cigars. I thought that, uh, that Tony was pretty funny, even though like I, I didn't really love the accent and everything. I did love how like his, his like deadpan jokes and his just mm-hmm. like, you know, really not, you know, bullshitting anyone The like little lines that he said were very clever and very fast and he was very quick witted. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I did really enjoy a lot of his like you know understated jokes that he would he would say to kind of like you know really poke at people or to to not back down from anyone giving him shit um i did think he was a very um you know funny clever witty character in that in that regard yeah um i thought the helicopter death of f oh murray God. abraham was very unnecessary very dramatic like hey let me go ahead and take you off to the side here fly you up in a helicopter beat the crap out of you and then push you out of this helicopter to hang you 
like so many other things like why not stab the guy why not just throw him out of the ele- out of the helicopter before you beat the crap out of him why why hang him why not just like throw him and let him hit the ground or something if you're gonna have to clean up a body anyways it seems impractical to be like i'm gonna throw this out of the helicopter hope i don't suddenly like lose balance on the copter or something stupid like that just seemed like but at the same time i mean yes i agree it was over the top mm-hmm. and not planning to ever having to do anything like that in my life but it seems like these people it's like they got nothing but time and money so why not just make it as extreme as possible and they obviously don't care that they're just gonna i just feel like they're i guess trying to intimidate tony because obviously this guy was gonna die doesn't matter if you beat him up before you kill him or not it's more to intimidate tony but i don't think that he seemed like he really cared about this guy kind of hated him and whether you just stabbed him, slashed him up, or threw him in a helicopter, it didn't seem to make much difference. Mm-hmm. Um, the casual poolside proposal to uh, Elvira, I just like she's already married to someone else. Yeah, and he's just casually gonna just hop by, have her make him a drink, mm-hmm. casually like propose. Do you want kids? <laughs> and then well, just leave let's get married <laughs> just, and like she's married to somebody else it's like how, is, do you see how this plan is like unfolding in your mind is is, is is are you living in a different reality or something just 100 percent. yeah just seemed very very odd i can't imagine something seriously someone seriously being like i'm gonna go ahead and just in this next moment it's just, just gonna propose be like we're gonna have do you want kids well, let's have some kids and uh i know you're already like married or have this other guy but like it's very weird yeah. um I thought he was pretty confident in talking to that detective, not any sort of code in the club. Obviously, ended up killing that detective later. But I feel like in later movies, at least, you'd have been worried about them wearing a wire or something mm-hmm. to be like, you know, catching them in the act of, of saying things. And obviously, he get, then gets later caught in the act um, with the, well, he's, they've counted the money. But I feel like they probably would have been a bit more hesitant to talk in the open about what they were actually doing or not like talk at some sort of code or something or, or completely sit there and deny, deny, deny that you were actually doing anything illegal. I mean, this is also the time before everybody had like a phone that could a record recorder. literally mm-hmm. everything at any time. <laughs> they would have had to like sit up his box to record him or mm-hmm. something. That maybe it was just not as much of a worry. Mm-hmm. It would take a lot more work. work. Yeah. yeah. Or even if you did, good luck recording that audio over the sound of a dance of a club. nightclub. Yeah. Um, I'm so glad that we don't have to wear suits to go out anymore. Maybe in some really high end clubs, but I saw all the people in those clubs and they were just wearing suits and it just seems very uncomfortable and impractical to be that dressed up. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and add, insert in. one of my notes in here now. Mm-hmm. Speaking of that, you wish you people could, wore suits again. No, <laughs> I mean, for your sake, it seems very impractical and very hot at all times that that sounds miserable. And mm-hmm. I'm glad for you that you don't have to do that, but just the clubs in general in the 80s i mm-hmm. mean it just i feel like they were so much tamer in certain ways like i feel like clubs now are just so much raunchier mm-hmm. obviously they were like doing drugs and people died there and like yeah there's a bit more grinding these yeah. days it just it's like the darker. dancing seems a lot more innocent and they like went to the bathroom to make out they were not making out on the, the dance cleanest floor. bathrooms I've ever seen in a club the most beautiful pristine bathrooms ever mm-hmm. This the whole club scene was not like any club that I've There's ever been in. in. There, yeah. Nowadays, yeah. everything you would be very see everybody. dark, strobing lights, music so loud that you can't even breathe, and so many people all shoved into one tiny room. Versus everybody that. making out, mm-hmm. really close, very raunchy. Definitely couldn't talk to anyone oh, God, in no. any part of that of a club nowadays. Honestly, I think I would feel more confident talking about my drug crimes mm-hmm. in a club now yeah because it's <laughs> so loud that nobody nobody the would be able to be sitting there just like you. nodding and being like i think he's talking about yeah, uh-huh, what, uh-huh. Yeah, uh. <laughs> prove that i said something about my drug overlord mm-hmm. palace i don't know that's not yeah. the right word over over a uh, drug empire over empire there it is <laughs> over all of that noise yeah. yeah zero chance that you'd be able to pick that up even with today's microphones um however what's something that has not changed is what's more american than mass shootings in a club Yikes. Yeah. Like, with, with like assault rifles. Yeah. It did seem kind of, kind of weird how casual these guys were just like, let me take my assault rifle out. Just oh, covered up with my napkin. Under, Nobody's oh, going to see out, it. Oh, and they choose the worst time to shoot him. If like, if they were trying to actually off this guy, he's clearly drunk in a moping mood sitting there in his booth. Why not walk over there and like shoot him point blank if you're going to do that versus let me wait until he's got some huge over like stuffed mannequin guy dancing singing yeah that was a weird like fever dream there um in front of him 
And then I'm going to shoot, miss him. These, yeah. Like, those hitmen are just terrible. Bad. Poor planning. Um, All bad. And I'll, I'll kind of touch on that again later too. Um, did the this drug lord not have any security? So when Tony and his guys come in to kill, um, what's his face, the original drug lord that he was working for, um, they just kind of walk right in to his place. There's no cameras. There's no there's no bodyguards. They just kind of walk in like with a gun, and they don't really seem to notice that the what, that one guy, the uh, Bruno Mars looking guy, has like this you know Tommy mm-hmm. gun with him, and just kind of seems like it was really kind of sloppy there. Yeah, I, I feel like if I were if I were him, I would have been as paranoid as Tony and had like so many cameras and so many like bodyguards and layers sure. of security there. I mean, I guess Ernie, the guy mm-hmm. that they didn't kill, mm-hmm. worked for Frank. And so like maybe he was his like security. Maybe he was just confident because he had that uh, dirty cop working with him that mm-hmm. he was like, oh, no one's going to come bother True. me because and I've got a cop here. Yeah. Still seemed kind of kind of silly. No, I agree. Um, I loved the 80s montage though. 80s slash I think they were also big in the 90s when he was carrying the bags of money to the bank and they're like they're making a big time he's he's kind of putting up his drug front of front of the uh Montana travel company and all that I just mm-hmm. love like the, the Montana salon mm-hmm, the, the the montage of that with the the music um going over that uh the casual wedding tiger that he had it's, I love that that's like, how you they, phrase it they get married and they're like hey guys it's a great ceremony and now we're going to rush now off everybody run rush from from the ceremony down to the hill towards this little stream where i have a casual like bengal tiger tied up across the river why hey why, why do you have a why do you have a tiger um are you why do you feel the need to show everyone at your wedding and like see are you not afraid the tiger like might get out or something or like yeah. doesn't seem like is there's there's much stopping him from like chewing your face off other than a small stream and like this little bitty chain yeah i felt bad for the tiger because mm-hmm. it seemed miserable mm-hmm. i thought it was weird that they all were like yeah come on let's run mm-hmm. no yeah like why do you need to see it right now has it probably been the tiger like before or after just kind of seem like a really unnecessary yeah. i was expecting a little bit more tigers i think yeah like where was the know. tiger during the whole uh break in at the end to, to assassinate him that is what they needed the tiger to break loose mm-hmm. and to eat to all the people him. who were trying to mm-hmm. oh that's the alternate ending that we all want yeah um so who lets a drug lord who's out on on bail when they've already caught him when well, they're counting the money he's laundering money all that sort of stuff who lets him leave the country i i didn't really catch why he was just so free to still do whatever he wanted like did he just like hire a helicopter and just go and nobody stopped him because border security wasn't that strong then i just feel like they would have put him under some sort of house arrest even then of like hey Mm -hmm. yeah you can't go to south america because you are a drug lord who's importing drugs from south america and do i remember correctly that his bail was five million dollars did I read that right? I don't remember what the what the number it was. It was like a post. But it was the... clearly not just a like, oh, we got him on some sort of small like charges here. It would have been enough to be like, yeah, you can't leave the country and mm-hmm. we're gonna have people watching to make sure you don't. Yeah. Just seems kind of crazy. Weird. Um I thought that the soundtrack, um, especially towards the end and to the very beginning, was a really good, like foreboding, like eighties synthesizer soundtrack. Um, just kind of go- gave like kind of a really ominous, like unsettling yeah. tone. But it also felt like a lot of times it was almost like it was covering um, the I can't help falling in love with you. It was like it would get like I 80% pick up of the way on there. Where I, was like, it. I was like, is it actually that song or is it? No, it, it kind of dies down now. It's like some sort of like weird synth remix of that song. I heard where you were getting at, but I also agree mm-hmm. that it would, you, just when you thought that that was it, it was, mm-hmm. it would switch and be something or sound different. Yeah. Um, and then finally, I have that they were terrible tacticians, like the, the hitman that we talked about at the club. And then also the guys that come to kill him at the end um, and the people that are protecting Tony just stand there in the, in the open with their guns and they're either not shooting at someone or they're not like hiding behind someone, something or to like shoot or wait or have some sort of like cover. Yeah, they're just um, out in the open. It's like if you were like a trained or hired bodyguard, I would hope I'd hire someone who like knew how to not just stand there in the open with my gun by my side while I got shot. Um, yeah. Just seemed like kind of like a very unrealistic it, it seemed like they were just extras hired to like have some weird like body shakes as they got shot and do the the, the typical like oh, i'm getting shoot by shot by a bunch of bullets um just seemed like they were very useless um hitmen and bodyguards there definitely 
Uh, and then finally, I want to give some shout outs to the best boy grip, Don Glenn, the best boys general, um, Dutch Presley and Bob Mund. Oh, did I type again? Bob someone. <laughs> you, you tried so hard to get it right. And the gaffer Stuart Spawn, Spoon, Spoon, S-P-O-H-N. I would say Spawn. Spawn. Stuart Spawn. Could not have made this movie without them. They were very yes. integral to the production of this movie. We're really, really here for the best boys. Best men. The best men. <laughs> oh, man. All right, my turn. Um, so I mentioned already that I was not really expecting the, like, political foreign affairs situation with mm -hmm. Cuba. Um, Which didn't really play much into the later, like, after he gets his green card. Didn't yeah. play much of a role. Which goes into my next one a little bit of there was an opening title sequence that really set the scene for the movie. Mm -hmm. And it really played up this like Castro, Cuba, the boats, bringing people over, like all of this mm -hmm. stuff. And after like 15 minutes, we were on to like literally anything else besides the fact that they were immigrants. Maybe there's a little bit kind of reference to it where they are. They mentioned it a couple times, but it's not yeah. as, it, I mean, it just, just becomes all about him being mm -hmm. a drug lord. So yeah. I thought that was interesting, but yay. Opening title sequence. I did appreciate mm -hmm. how it at least set up the beginning of the movie. Mm -hmm. Give you some sort of backstory backdrop mm -hmm. setting the uh, stage. And then uh, I thought it was interesting how they asked him, Tony Montana in his interrogation when he was, I, I guess, coming into the country of whether he was a homosexual. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that was because of the AIDS epidemic at the mm -hmm. time epidemic is that right the right word yes yeah that's what um, it was referred to at the time yeah. at least the that HIV i was like are, are we epidemic. like because it's the eight like early mm -hmm. 80s is this like really why we're asking this and trying to prevent and mm -hmm. control that not so much i don't think they really i cared. did appreciate tony pushing back and being like why does that matter mm -hmm. oh for sure mm -hmm. um like, why would you ask that type thing and then the Miami, I don't know if architecture is the right word, but I said, I like, first was like, oh, like the 80s Miami architecture, but I think it's probably a little more ref reflective of like maybe like the 50s and 60s and was still reminiscent, but the the light pink and the teals and the neon signs mm -hmm. and um, I don't know, just that whole Miami look. I really loved like the way the clubs looked. Yeah, I, I get it. It almost feels like sometimes I see those same colors and that same architecture and I feel like I'm in like a weird time warp when I see those nowadays. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that was very much like the style and colors of the time. For sure. I It really stood out to me in the beginning and it kind of obviously at once he got all his fame and fortune and built his giant mm -hmm. marble house. Um, we lost that a little bit, but just like seeing the outside of those buildings and the um, those colors and the like rounded edges of buildings and all that kind of stuff. I thought it was just really reminiscent of the times. Um, Al Pacino shirts, at least in the beginning. The very beginning, yeah. He obviously ditched those as he got more money, but that tiger, I, don't, I, mean, I want to call it a Hawaiian shirt, but like that He's tiger like print shirt was something. Murder some dude in cold blood in the middle of the street in that very noticeable shirt. Then it's just like riding around in that same shirt the rest of the day. And it's like the same one he's been wearing. I'm like, you'd be very identifiable in that. Mm -hmm. A man in a red short sleeve button down that has tigers on it. Mm -hmm. That's not something that's stealthy. Like you're very obviously going to be found. I did not found. see any other people wearing that same shirt for sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, uh, the yeah. police must not have uh, tried too much to find the yeah. murderer of that other. Yeah. And he know. was so bold to just, I guess... That's my next note is shooting the guy in the middle of the street. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm chasing you. And I'm just going to stand here right in front of all those people that are watching right over there. And I'm just going to shoot you right in the forehead. Mm -hmm. I think was, that was maybe partly to illustrate the the stage they were setting with all the crime going on in mm -hmm. South Florida, that there was just so much crime that no one would really um, be able to find everyone that killed someone. Or maybe it was trying to show that like, because he, it was a um, very like immigrant heavy town that people wouldn't have ratted him out there True. maybe. Uh, but my note on the Otherwise, shooting the guy. Otherwise it would be very easy to find this guy. They'd be like, oh yeah, yeah. the guy with the big scar on his face wearing that crazy shirt. <laughs> Found him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but my note on that was he shot the guy in the street. But in nowadays, 2023, how many iPhones would be mm -hmm. recording all of that and you would easily just yeah. pick that up so quick. Mm -hmm. Definitely something that would be different. Could it be made today? <laughs> would yeah. be a mildly a easy to find him because yeah, like 
it wouldn't have taken place today for mm-hmm. sure um 80s clubs look more innocent definitely different than what they are now um the 550 dollar um bottle of champagne mm-hmm. a little fancier than the wine that we're drinking but he was all excited about his 550 dollar mm-hmm. i believe it was dom perignon from another reference that yeah. they talked about later in it but um just had to shout out the wine mm-hmm. since we are drinking yeah the then we're, we're not drinking toby james in the in the club there i know unfortunately um also i feel like in the beginning at least the first hour there were a lot of very intense sunset scenes and like in the background mm-hmm. that like first time i was like oh it's a sunset and there's a the second one and then there might have been three where i was just like wow we were just really leaning into this time of day to shoot these dramatic scenes mm-hmm. Don't know if that was intentional or set up of this some is kind. more showing his move from the sunset into the l- night lifestyle. Maybe. He used to be a day man and now yeah. he's a night man. There it is. La! Or maybe he was showing that he, um, I don't know, I had a thought before he started singing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just love that song. <laughs> uh, if he comes back to you, bring it back. <laughs> Um, and then I also have to point out that he was wearing high heeled shoes at one point. I didn't write down when it was, but he was wearing one of his suits and they like zoomed out farther and his shoes had actual like platforms on them. Mm-hmm. And I just feel like that's something you just don't see men in suits wearing anymore. It's those platform shoes. Heeled shoes. Yeah. I feel like you'd kind of get some shit for it. Um, what I was going to say was he was losing his like touch with like not nature, but like reality after that, mm-hmm. like he was kind of losing his last bit of grounding there. Cause later you don't kind of see that it's everything happens like in the middle of the night mm-hmm. or clearly in the daytime. It kind of, you know, lost that. Yeah. Bit. But maybe I'm just reading too much into the symbolism there. Yeah. We're getting too deep in this culture and iPod. Um, they also did show like they were very big on showing clocks of like, this mm-hmm. is the time, even when they shot Frank in the office, mm-hmm. I'm gonna, three, three sharp. And then, three and then they showed the clock and three Oh three, he was dead. And just, I, I don't know if that was it, that super clock when they were counting the money and like the 12 was clearly missing i was like i was like man what a crappy clock it's missing the 12 but like if you're trying to hide a camera there it was a very large obvious one yeah. i feel like you could have done a better job of hiding that or like painted something over top of it to mm-hmm. i don't know make it a little less noticeable mr technology would that camera in the clock have been that practical and realistic in the 80s um i mean i feel like you could put the sensor there but it would have probably had a more like substantial body somewhere behind, behind that um but i can't say i know too much about spy cameras from 1981 makes sense um my next note is lots of vibes from the jerk obviously the jerk came out before this but just the very similar archetype rags to riches let me spend all my rags money to on to rags or death yeah yeah on useless stuff giant houses that are way over the top um and then the um, in Frank's office, you were like, "Is that Richard Nixon?" Mm-hmm. And just like the pictures of important political figures behind his desk. And then I also noticed real role model there in the like police interrogation scenes. There was pictures of Jimmy Carter, the current. Mm-hmm. I assume he was president then. Yeah. And that I just made confidently, me. I'm assuming he was because they. And I was like, "You're super confident." But I have no idea. Um, and like thinking back to like. Leslie Nope from Parks and Rec, who had all those like influential people pictured mm-hmm. behind her desk. Like, was that a thing to have? Like, can you imagine having like, just like I think, was Joe Biden like thing. right behind you all the time, or like all of your favorite like coding heroes, mm-hmm. just a framed picture of them on your desk? That just Watching seems over you. But I, mean, I feel like in a government odd. building, it might have been a bit more common there. But the one that we had them in his office where he's like clearly committing a bunch of crimes and does not give a shit about anything to have a president there unless you're trying to say yeah the criminal president that's the one that i like one i love (laughs) yeah um seemed like an odd choice to to pick yeah i just feel like that was definitely something you saw a lot more in the past i don't know how much people have framed political figures i think nowadays it's very it's very polarizing where you either like love them or you hate them and if you love them you better love them a lot because if someone else sees them and hates that same political figure then it's just asking for unnecessary fights Mm -hmm. it's so fun to be here (laughs) um and then i guess the last note i have written down is them just carrying the duffel bags of money into the bank like you couldn't have anything stealthier Mm -hmm. stealthier than that yeah briefcases i mean they've got a whole bunch of like small bills obviously they're talking about how like the ten dollar bills five dollar bills is there no way to clean that you know into larger bills before you bring it in there so you don't have to bring them into duffel bags i can't think of many legitimate businesses that would have been doing that yeah 
but just you're just asking to be caught. Like you're a travel company, and people are just paying you a whole bunch of singles. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah. And I had something, and I lost it. Just like it's, I mean, no shock. He was caught. He was mm-hmm. not trying to be stealthy about it. Yeah. Just carrying in giant. He was. Yeah, I guess he was caught there with the count of the money there. But his downfall was not getting caught by the law. It was more mm-hmm. um, getting a little bit too. I wouldn't say cocky because it's like he grew a conscience and that's what kind of led to his downfall there was because he didn't kill a mother and her children mm-hmm. that was alongside the, the guy who's trying to take out. Um, it, seemed like a, it seemed like there was this big buildup and they didn't really know how they were going to lead to his downfall or couldn't choose. So they just chose a really random mm-hmm. one. I mean, I will be honest. I'm shocked that he died. Mm-hmm. That I didn't write it down, but like final note, like when they actually killed him, I was like totally expecting him to get away or that maybe there was a Scarface 2 I hadn't heard about. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I just, I was not he expecting got, his downfall. He did take like 40 bullets where he went down because his body, his bloodstream was like 90% cocaine by that point. Sure. Um, but it was kind of weird. The, the hitman that did take him down, the guy like in the sunglasses at night that just, I don't know if he was representing something of like the next hitman that takes down the next crime boss that kind mm-hmm. of like showed like it was a circle of circle of life of, <laughs> circle uh, of, you know, of drug taking lords. down people that next person takes him down this is what the next guy was supposed to be or something i don't know why the guy had to like be so secretive and have those glasses because clearly tony was not going to live even if the guy didn't take him out with the double barreled shotgun that he did um he had taken enough bullets that he would have eventually died even if they mm-hmm. got him straight to hospital from that point but yeah. Seemed kind of weird. Unless it was just kind of like building into the whole action, like, you know, men, boys being like, yeah, we want to see a lot of bullets and guns in the very end. Like, stay till the end so you can see the crazy fight sequence, but seemed weird. It was probably that. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> that feels about right. Yeah, that was, um, that was something. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I do feel cultured. I'm glad we've seen it. It was not a bad movie. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it maybe would be told more concisely and maybe the storytelling, like you said, would be a little bit yeah, better I now. Think, I'd like to see like a Christopher Nolan like remake of it because he's more, I guess he does make some longer movies, but you could push this this storyline a bit faster and get a much more concise mm-hmm. um, story and, and movie that uh, I'd like to see the, the condensed version for sure. Yes. We almost watched it on double speed, but we decided that was not probably not the way it was supposed to be seen. <laughs> yeah. It would have been impossible to understand what they were saying half the time too. Yes. Also full disclosure, we turned on the closed captions so that we could make sure we could follow. Yeah. I mean, movies along. nowadays, I feel like with the the thin TVs, we need to get our, a better sound system in here. They're hard to hear a lot of the vocals just because of how the speakers have to be kind of fit into such a small footprint. But I feel like his accent did not do us any favors. For sure. But, but anyways, that episode was episode 13, episode 13, All Scarface right. and, um, cheers. cheers again. Thank you for listening. And, um, if you're enjoying the podcast, you can get rate and review on wherever you listen to your podcast or subscribe to us on YouTube. You can also follow us on Instagram at culture night pod or on Twitter at culture night pod or on YouTube at culture night pod mm-hmm. to see some behind the scenes stuff, to stay up to date with what we're watching when we post new episodes what wine we're drinking, all the things. And be sure to tune in next week so you can hear our thoughts on deep dives from this movie and our subbed on it rating and review of the movie after we've had some time to to really process it. Mm -hmm. And again, if you have any suggestions for movies or genres that we should dive into next, feel free to uh, comment, comment, tweet, email. Mm -hmm. Email us at culturenightpod at gmail.com. Comment on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, all the places. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll catch you next week. Bye.